Hello and welcome to The Politics Show this week. From up yours, the laws, to no way, Jose, can Europe's leaders come up with a popular plan C? And The Politics Show tries to fix it for three young viewers campaigning for, yes, for a new exam. Here, a council leader faces calls to quit after using a phrase with racist undertones. Is it a resigning issue or taking political correctness too far? All that and the Cabinet Minister Andy Burnham and the Shadow Foreign Secretary William Haig. First, though, the news with Tim Wilcox. Tim. John, thank you very much. Good afternoon. The government says the loss of sensitive official documents is completely inexcusable, adding it is taking steps to ensure there are no further breaches of security. It comes after a second set of secret documents were found on a train. The Home Secretary is to be asked to appear before MPs next week to explain why the papers were lost. Our political correspondent David Thompson has more. Strangeness on a train. Just why would not one, but two civil servants leave sensitive documents on a London commuter service? First, the BBC, and now a Sunday newspaper, have been given material found lying in a carriage by a member of the public. That's added to the pressure on the government. Later this week, Jackie Smith, the Home Secretary, will have to tell MPs whether or not these security lapses are hampering the fight against terrorism. Today, her colleagues had to face the flak. The government takes all reports of security breaches extremely seriously. These sort of lapses are completely inexcusable. I know that this will be taken with the utmost seriousness and will be followed up to ensure that there isn't a further threat to the national interest. The pages contained information about the funding of terrorism and its financial networks, the smuggling of drugs around the world, money laundering and financial crime. The material handed to the BBC was highly sensitive. These documents, less so. But this latest lapse in security has allowed the opposition to put pressure on the government. The information that uh, could have been exposed is potentially prejudicial you know, to national security and certainly to the public interest of this country. Uh, it also tells uh, foreign governments that this is a government in the United Kingdom that really is in control of the situation. Security is an issue which transcends political loyalties. This week, Jackie Smith will be making sure her officials have their briefing papers close to hand. David Thompson, BBC News. Two gay Anglican priests have angered traditionalists by exchanging vows and rings in a ceremony held at a church in London. The blessing took place last month before a congregation of 300 friends and relatives. It's the first time a Church of England ceremony modelled on the traditional wedding service has been held for a same-sex couple. Shell says only a small number of its petrol stations across Britain have run dry on the third day of the tanker driver strike. They're refusing to deliver fuel to the company's petrol stations in a dispute over pay. Simon Jack has more. As the strike enters its third day, some petrol stations are running dry, but this remains the exception rather than the rule. Latest figs from Shell show that of their nearly 10,000 sites, fewer than 200 are out of petrol. However, the company says as the strike continues, it will have a significant impact. So that figure is likely to rise. Were you surprised to find it empty here today? No, I've been following the papers uh, this week, but um, I'm surprised. I don't know how hard I'm going to have to uh, look for fuel. How many stations have you tried? Tried from uh, Wimbledon all the way up here. How many? Oh, there must have been about five. Demand at the forecourt has risen by 25%. But still, there is little sign yet of the kind of panic buying that some feared. The pay dispute that is preventing fuel deliveries remains unresolved, and further strikes are planned for next weekend. Retailers and the government are hoping that this weekend means motorists will be better prepared next time around. Simon Jack, BBC News. That's the news for now. The next bulletin here on BBC One is at five past seven. Back to you, John. Tim, thanks very much. Now, the mood among Europe's political leaders this weekend can safely be said to echo the sentiments of that famous old political quotation. The people have spoken, the bastards. And with Ireland having spoken so clearly, the question for presidents and prime ministers preparing for a summit in Brussels this week is what to do next. Do they carry on ratifying the existing treaty like Britain? Or exit and start again. After all, we've been down this route before. Plan A was the Constitution. Well, the Dutch and French saw that off. Plan B was the Treaty. No thanks, said the Irish. So with alarming alphabetical speed, we're on to Plan C. 
Or is there a plan C? Well, you may recall this from a report we carried on the programme a fortnight ago. The failed constitution was plan A, that the Lisbon Treaty is plan B, and that there is no plan C. Uh, it couldn't be clearer than that. There is no uh, secret document in a bottom drawer anywhere in, in Europe uh, to deal with uh, a situation where the treaty is not ratified. Don't say we didn't warn you. And in the absence of a plan C, both wings of the European debate have been keen to come up with their own solutions to what the French president, Nicolas Sarkozy, referred to yesterday as the Irish incident. Notre premier élément, on continue à ratifier. Our first view is that we keep going on with the ratification. But on the other hand, we still have to keep thinking and work together. It's not by accident. It's not a surprise. Yesterday, I had a chat with the Irish Prime Minister. Many people in Europe do not understand the way we build Europe today. We have to take that on board, and very quickly, and we have to change our ways of building up Europe. The European idea is the greatest of all. This is what the founding fathers of Europe did half a century ago. The third reading of this, of this European treaty that is due to go through the House of Lords next week should be stopped immediately. You know, I mean, I mean you know, I'd love a referendum on it, but, but just for now, Gordon Brown, please stop the ratification of this project. That's what I want to see. But I suspect what's going to happen is just the same as happened two years ago when the French and Dutch voted no. I don't think these people behind the European Union understand what the word no means. They're going to push on in their arrogant way and they're going to say, I'm sorry, we don't care what you think. We, we actually now hold democracy in contempt and we're going to push on with our plans. So, just an awkward speed bump or the end of the road for the treaty? Our Europe editor, Mark Mardell, surve surveys the damage from Brussels. To some, joy to be alive that day. To others, a crushing crisis. But was it a shock to Europe's political elite? No, not really. Just what they've long feared. After all, the people of Europe have form as long as your arm. Remember, the Danes said no to the Maastricht Treaty and earned a few opt-outs. The Irish said no to Nice and got a clarification. The French and Dutch said no to the European Constitution and got the Lisbon Treaty instead. That's the one signed by everybody, well, everybody except Gordon Brown, in the Portuguese capital last December. You know, the one where Article 1A says it's founded on the values of human dignity, freedom and democracy. Ah, democracy. Tricky one, that. Of course, some, like the unlikely couple of the French president and the German chancellor, feel it's not very democratic for one country to stop all the others going ahead with the project. So what might they do? First, call poor Biffo to account. The Irish Prime Minister Brian Cowan has been told to explain himself to the crisis summit on the principle, you broke it, you fix it. He could argue for a wheeze to allow Ireland to vote again, like keeping this man. Charlie McCreevy is Ireland's commissioner. At the moment, all countries have one. Under Lisbon, all countries would have one for only 10 years out of every 15. If the Irish killed off the slimming down of the commission, they could justifiably claim things had changed. In preparation for this, or indeed anything else, parliaments around Europe will be asked to back the treaty. And following ratification of the Treaty of Lisbon. The Lords will vote in the next few days. It's on the general principle that you might as well be in a position to go for it if something happens. No campaigners can celebrate, the people have spoken, but don't forget, it's the politicians who'll decide. Mark Mardell reporting. Well, I'm joined now by the Shadow Foreign Secretary, William Haig. Uh, Mr Haig, thanks very much for being with us. Uh, the Conservative Party makes much of British sovereignty, so why don't we carry on with ratification? Who cares what the Irish have decided? Well, Ireland is a, a sovereign, independent nation as well, and they're one of the 27 countries that have to agree to this treaty for it to be ratified. Uh, now that they have said no, I think the only point in other countries continuing to ratify the treaty is to put pressure on the Irish, to bully the Irish, if you like, a kind of preparatory move to saying to the Irish, uh, well, you're going to have to vote again on this. And that is why I don't like the government going ahead with ratification, uh, completing that in the House of Lords. They should instead be giving a lead in the opposite direction and saying, look, the people of Ireland have said this, and the people of Britain would say this if were asked, and of many other countries, let's treat this as a wake-up call and stop this 
centralising agenda and abandon this treaty. Yeah, but who knows what will unfold? I mean, the Irish could even leave the EU and then there'll be 26 countries left. I mean, you know, I'm talking about extremes. In which case, why don't we just carry on with the ratification and what happens with uh, Ireland can sort itself out? Well, uh, there you are talking about extremes. The Irish are not going to leave the European Union. But remember that this is not really just Ireland. Uh, it's easy to say, well, 26 countries have agreed to it and only one has disagreed. But, of course, they're the only ones who've had a vote. And the European Constitution, which was 90% the same thing, was rejected by the voters of France and the Netherlands in their referendums three years ago. Most countries that have had referendums on this document or something similar to it have rejected it. So there's a fundamental problem here for the European Union, which is you can't build pol political institutions in democratic countries without popular consent. And that at the moment is what Europe's leaders are trying to do. So Mr Hay, what can you practically do to delay the, the further ratification of this process? Because it goes to the House of Lords this week. Well, uh, Conservatives in the House of Lords will, of course, uh, argue that uh, the bill should not have its third reading, that it shouldn't be completed this week. Um, as ever, the position there will, will depend on the Liberal Democrats, who say that the, the view views of Ireland should, should be respected, and I think Nick Clegg has said this morning that the treaty ought to be considered dead. However, they also look likely to vote to continue the ratification, but that is a sort of shambles we often get from the from the Liberal Democrats on this subject. So Tories will, Tories will argue but we for will a delay. we will try to stop it. You'll try to stop it or Absolutely delay? Absolutely we will. I've, I've, of course we've argued all along against it and we've argued all along for a referendum. But we think that at the very least now the, the, the progress through the House of Lords should be suspended. And instead of the government sitting there waiting to see what everybody else says, they should for once take a lead in European affairs and advise other European leaders that this is just not a project that's continued with anymore. So Europe doesn't need anything then. We've got a Europe now of 27 members with a decision-making process that was designed for a much, much smaller European Union. I don't think it does need uh, the reform. And in fact, a number of studies have shown over the last couple of years that it's been working much better than it did before. Now, this has not been an expected development. When people started work on this treaty, they didn't actually realize that the European Union would work pretty well without these reforms. But what seems to have happened is that in a union of 27, countries are much more cautious about using their vetoes. There are genuine efforts at building consensus. Uh, the former Foreign Secretary, Margaret Beckett, just uh, last year said that uh, she thought that things were working much better than they were before. And so that there is no need for this treaty and for setting up a permanent president, a foreign minister of Europe, for abolishing 60 national vetoes is not necessary and no one has to buy the argument that we have to do it in order to have, to have an argument. The facts don't show that anymore. Uh, you obviously feel very strongly about this. Have you thought about, I don't know, forcing a by-election on it? <laughs> no, I, I, I don't agree with that way forward for individual MPs. I would have preferred uh, David Davis to stay at his post as Shadow Home Secretary, although I wish him very well in what he's done. I hope he will be safely returned to Parliament with, uh, with a large majority. But uh, if we honest... all embarked on that course... Go tell, on. Yeah, tell me honestly, what was your first reaction when you heard? Did you think he'd gone mad? No, I was surprised uh, to hear it. This was not a decision that we took together. It was not something that uh, he consulted his senior colleagues about. But I think... One of the good things for us, uh, looking back at this last few days, and looking at today's opinion polls, which show an increased Conservative lead, is that we're doing well enough now in the Conservative Party to take this sort of thing in our stride. We have a brilliant leader and a strong team. We've got some really good talents on the way up. So there is a new Shadow Home Secretary who is already showing he's very good at the job. And I think we can, we can take these things in our stride pretty well now. Just to confirm, you think he was wrong? I wouldn't have done that myself, so I, I disagree uh, with that decision, but I agree very much with his views on civil liberties. Uh, and as I say, I hope now that he's done it, uh, I wish him well, I hope he's returned to Parliament. Uh, but it wasn't a collective decision, it wasn't, it wasn't a decision that we took together. Why was it the wrong decision? Well, as I say, I, I would have preferred him to stay at his post as Shadow Home Secretary because he's done an outstanding job at that the last few years. 
Uh, and there's much to be done in Parliament over the coming weeks and months uh, on that. But now he's taken this decision. We have to make the best of it. Uh, I hope he does well. As I say, there's a new good shadow Home Secretary, and the Conservative Party is forging ahead uh, despite this unexpected event uh, because fundamental forces in politics, including the fact we've sorted ourselves out and we have a truly terrible government, as the country can now see, are all very much on our side. William Hay, you're speaking in code. You clearly think it's an excruciatingly bad decision. I'm not at all speaking in code. I think I've been very frank uh, about that. I'd have preferred him to stay at his post. But I'm also very frank. Uh, is it a setback for the Conservative Party? No, that would be making is it a too stunt? much of it. Yeah. Is it a stunt? No, I don't think so. Because No, no, no. I think we should, uh, in all of this, we should respect David Davis for the decision that he's taken. And there can be no doubt that he feels very strongly, and indeed we all agree with him in feeling very strongly about civil liberties issue and about the vote that took place earlier this week. So no, I don't think that would be right to describe it as a stunt. Uh, I hope it works out well for him, uh, and I hope he's returned with, with a good majority. And I just want to ask you one other question relating to your brief as uh, Shadow Foreign Secretary. Uh, the US President, Mr Bush, is arriving uh, in uh, London uh, later on today. Now, one of the things he's cautioned against is that there should be an artificial timetable set uh, for British troop withdrawals from Iraq. He's right, isn't he? Yes, he's right that there shouldn't be an artificial timetable. It must depend on the security situation. It is encouraging that the security situation has improved in some respects, including in Basra, since recent operations by the Iraqi army. So the decision about the presence of the 4,000 British troops must depend on that security situation. But I think we all hope that that situation will have improved enough before long that those troops can be withdrawn. After all, we are very heavily committed to Afghanistan as well. OK, William Haig, thanks very much indeed for joining us. Thank and you. there is actually a little bit more from Mr Haig uh, later on in the programme. And as he was making clear there, it's not just been David Davis and the Conservatives who've been exercised over the issue of 42-day detention. There's been rebellion and real anger within the Labour Party too. Now, as Mayor of London on 7-7, Ken Livingstone is one of the few politicians with real experience of dealing with the terror threat. And this weekend, he dismissed his party's line as political positioning. I'm not aware in the eight years I was mayor that the mayor ever was in a position where it would have to release someone because they couldn't get all they wanted um, in terms of evidence. Often I mean, breaking into the encryption and getting, it often takes months and months to completely analyse the contents of someone's um, computer. But you will inevitably find in the first three or four days they found things that they can charge them with um, and then that the other stuff can come along months later. So I don't actually think there's a policing need. If there's a policing need uh, that could have persuaded me, of course you'd support it. Um, but I don't think there's that need at all. Ken Livingston there, and I'm joined now by the Cabinet Minister Andy Burnham. So up and coming, we're told, that he's being tipped as one day a successor uh, to Gordon Brown, although when that will be, who knows. Now, uh, Andy Burnham, thank you very much for joining us on The Politics Show. You're you welcome. heard Ken Livingston there saying that um, actually the whole issue of 42 days was political positioning by the government. Well, I just don't accept that for one minute, uh, John. I mean, you have some of the most uh, senior police figures in the land saying that this is necessary, and I don't think you can just brush that away. And that's really what I find so surprising about what uh, David Davis is, has done uh, this week. At first, I just thought, well, this is a, a self-indulgent uh, stunt. Uh, we know his views. Why does he have to put his constituents through uh, a by-election and waste public money in the process? But the more I've thought about it, the more I'm staggered by what he's done, because he has now expanded it to include CCTV, which played a big role in capturing the, um, the, 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 the London uh, bombers, um, he's also included the DNA database. I could not go to my constituents proposing the removal of CCTV and expect to win support. They'd tell me where to go. So go into the constituency and challenge that argument if you're so confident about it. Well, I would, in my constituency, be ready to have that discussion any day. People are aware of my, of my views on these issues. Do you think I, Labour I, should field a candidate then? Well, the decision will be taken in due course. There isn't What's a by-election. There isn't a by-election yet. As I think, as I say, I think this is a very self-indulgent uh, thing to have done. 
I also think that it wastes it wastes uh, public money. Sh but but actually, sure, but David, you, you say you relish the argument. Well, but, why don't you get? Is it but, your view that you should field a candidate? Well, let me just make the, let me just make this point, Sir John. Uh, the NEC and the party will take a view on whether to fight this election. We we think it's an unnecessary by-election. That's our basic position. But let me just say say this, David. I mean, I've heard people saying in David's before constitu you move on. Let me, just, let, me, let me just finish that point. I've heard, I've, I want to know whether you are in favour yourself of fielding it's a, a decision. Candidate. It's a decision for the party. I think it's a completely unnecessary uh, by-election, and those are circumstances in which the Labour Party finds itself in. But it's not principally about us. This is about David Davis and the Tory Party. He is saying that um, uh, he wants to fight on these issues. I don't think his northern constituency is that different from mine, and I think the views of his constituents about CCTV, the DNA database, would be broadly, in his constituency, broadly similar to people in my constituency. He says he's got David Cameron uh, behind him. I think this is actually going to open up a, a, a dividing line between the parties here. Well, if you're so confident of that there is this dividing line, then surely the thing that the Labour Party ought to be doing is now thinking, right, well, let's have this fight. Let's take it to it. We'll, we'll, well, we're ready for it. The party will make its uh, judgment in due course about what to do. As I say, we would not. We think this is unnecessary. We think it's uh, a, a stunt. And actually, it will, uh, I think, uh, put, put lots of people through uh, an unnecessary uh, inconvenience. But the party in due course will decide if, I say if, a by-election is, is finally, finally called. But I do think it exposes an issue about uh, the Tory position on these, these issues where, they, where people do support the role of the DNA database in solving murders that have been unsolved for decades, horrific rapes that have been solved through the DNA database. If he, if he really does want to debate these issues, I'd be surprised if his constituents are completely with him on all of these points. You don't think that there's a danger that actually MPs who have got a, got a way of thinking about things, that they kind of live <coughs> in their bubble in L London SW1, think, oh, David Davis, he's gone bonkers. And that may be whether it's on the Tory benches or the Labour benches. But out in the country, it is resonating with people that they look at him and think, here is a man of principle. Here is a man who's prepared to stand up for what he believes in, even if it costs him his political career. Well, I've got a lot of time on a personal level for David Davis, and I respect him. Uh, in many ways. But I say on this occasion, I think he's been um, self-indulgent uh, and actually uh, and made a wrong decision that will backfire on the Conservative Party. I take, I'm interested in your point about the Westminster uh, village. I think when you test these issues, these, precisely these issues, out in the country, you often get a very different response than you do within the Westminster village. And that's where I think he's made a, a fundamental mis misjudgment. Because if you test in Halton Price and Howden the question of CCTV, do people want it or do they not want it? You ask them, do they think the DNA database is a useful tool for the police in fighting crime? My judgment is that people in his constituency will say, yes, we do support these things. And if David is really saying, let's purely debate these issues, I, I suspect he may end up okay, being very, on the wrong side of the argument. It's very quickly, and if you think that 42 days is such an important issue and you are defeated in the House of Lords, will you make this commitment that you will reintroduce the 42 days measure and, if necessary, use the Parliament Act to get it through? Well, I can't make these commitments. Those are, those are judgments for the Prime Minister. But what you have seen is the government on these difficult issues, which do need to be debated fully. You have seen the government coming forward, taking the tough decisions and prepared to put the interests of national security above all things. Yes, it is politically difficult. Yes, there is a difficult argument uh, to make, but you do see a government that is still there, putting the difficult choices before the country, prepared to take a, a difficult decision. And I find it odd, actually, that today's Conservative Party, when we were looking at the situation in Northern Ireland and the things that needed to be done, is now taking the position that it is. Well, let's talk about Europe for a minute. Why aren't you, as a government, prepared to say that this treaty, as things stand, is dead? Well, I think the first thing that I, I want to say there is that you can never explain away uh, a referendum as, you know, so there, there is no question at all that that could, that could happen. But at the same time, let's worry about our own game before we start telling other governments how to do things. We have a ratification process here in this country that we have devoted an enormous amount of parliamentary time to because of concerns in the country about the issues. And we need to see that job through before we start um, telling other people okay. what we think they should do. Understood. So would you agree then that as things stand, this treaty is dead? What, what I would say is it needs all members of the, uh, of the European Union to ratify it if it is to come into, into force. And that that, that yeah. is a fact. I mean, there, there is no getting away from that fact. But I think principally, the Irish government needs to uh, re reflect on the, the events of the last few days. And as David Miliband was saying this morning, it would appear that other domestic issues have played a part in the vote. Sure. But then there also clearly needs to be a discussion 
at the European Council later, later this week. And uh, I think after those two things have happened, we'll be clearer about the way forward. Uh, then, so the simple answer to my question, as things stand, the treaty is dead, is yes, it is. I, there is a process to be gone through now. And there is <laughs> Why a can't need, you say it? There is a need for a discussion uh, next, uh, uh, next uh, week in the European, the European Council. I couldn't say it more clearly, could I? That well, it no, needs you, could, all, you could say, as things all, stand, the treaty is dead. It needs all 27 countries uh, to ratify it. And these are precisely the things that, that people are now going to discuss. But I think Ireland was in a similar position uh, over, over the Nice Treaty uh, some, some years ago. Now, I'm not suggesting at all that you can explain away or wipe away the vote in Ireland. I'm not saying that. No. But I am saying that Europe collectively needs to look at its options now and decide on a way forward. And when we were talking about CCTV and 42 days and DNA database, you were citing the views of your uh, constituents. What do you think your constituents think of this? Well, I'd make a very, I would always be prepared to make an argument, a pro-European argument in my constituency because my constituency has received uh, money uh, from the European Union to fund economic regeneration, as has have, lots of Ireland. You could actually, have let them actually. have a say on it. Well, I think it's, it's, it's one thing that is clear here, and perhaps the Nice example in Ireland shows it, that when you have a commitment to, to always put these votes to a referendum, these are very complex and technical uh, matters. I don't think that lend themselves particularly easily. Are you, you're uh, not saying your constituents wouldn't understand it, are you? Oh, certainly not. Not at all. I said I would always be prepared to take Well, uh, you're saying the Irish discussions. didn't understand it then? No, I'm not saying that. But David Miliband was clear this morning that it would appear that issues around taxation, I think he mentioned abortion too, have played a role in the, in the voting in Ireland. I'm not close enough to Irish politics, I'm afraid, John, to say precisely how that, that vote played out. But uh, I think these are issues and urgent questions to be considered in the next few days. OK, let us move on and talk about your own government's direction. Last September, you wrote, what the Labour Party, what the Labour Party stands for isn't as clear to young people today. There is a need for a new expression of our aims and values. Well, nine months on, are we any clearer? I think so. I think we've got a government now that is beginning to really put before the country uh, a clear way ahead. It's uh, only part of the part of the, uh, the the landscape, but I've been proposing Not going recently that well, then, is it? issues to do with um, sport and physical activity in the country. The proposal around uh, free free swimming. Yeah, it's been a difficult time for the government, but I think in politics, what matters uh, you have ups and downs. The question is, how do you handle them? Do you have some togetherness within the uh, the party and in the cabinet? And I think we do. And I think we've, um, we, we, particularly on these issues that we were discussing earlier, the Labour Party has a real and distinctive uh, programme to put to the country and we'll carry on doing that. Well, what is the big idea? The big idea is around, in my view, and Gordon has made, been very clear on this point, is around aspiration, opportunity. In the first ten years of this government, I think we were righting lots of real wrongs in terms of the crumbling state of our schools, the appalling state of our NHS. And we've had a programme of ten years' investment in this country when Gordon came in as Prime Minister, he said the next phase is about talent, ambition, opportunity. I look at my constituency today and I believe people can now have bigger ambitions about our local community and their own lives. And that is the ground on which Labour should, should speak to young people there is something, and put forward a vision there is, for the There country. is something that's slightly counterintuitive about this. You said that in the past nine months it's become a lot clearer what we stand for. And in those nine months you've gone from a position where you were sort of broadly ahead in the polls to 24 points behind. Maybe you should have been obscure. It was obviously <laughs> suiting you better. Well, I'm, not, I'm not going to, uh, uh, to, to say that the polls don't matter. Obviously we, 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 we've been through uh, a difficult few months. But when you say well, what, what do you stand for... We have taken a stand over 42 days. You can't criticise us for that, uh, John. We have put a very clear position. We've stuck by our guns and we've prepared to take a difficult matter to the country. If this was a political party with no courage left, no ability to make a case to the country, then we would have quite folded that issue away and walked away from it. We've not done that and we are prepared to put forward what we think is in the national interest. And I believe you've still got a government here that has togetherness, that has a collective vision for the country, and we, yes, perhaps we need to do more to make the case for it, but you will see that from people like me in the months ahead. Andy Bernard, thank you very thank much you. indeed. Now, next week we'll have the first interview with one of the authors of a government report on the uses of our personal data, a subject close to David Davis's heart. Well, if you've got a question you'd like us to ask, you can send it to us via the website and much more uh, there besides too. Now, later in the programme, can we fix it for three teenage viewers who want a politics exam introduced? See how they get on when they take their campaign all the way to Parliament. That's all after the politics show where you are.
Welcome to the programme for everyone in the East Midlands. Later, as the government reads the Riot Act on failing schools, is it turning a deaf ear to the problems of pupils with hearing problems? We often hear statements that, oh, we don't know we've got a deaf child in the classroom. Why don't you know you've got a deaf child in the classroom? That deaf child, you know, requires the very best we can give them. And as we prepare to celebrate the 60th anniversary of the NHS, former Health Secretary Ken Clark insists politicians and doctors should know their place. The truth is that the, the minister couldn't cure a common, common cold and the average doctor couldn't run a work stall. And, and all this gets confused in a, a permanent political dialogue. First, a Lib Dem council leader is facing calls for his resignation after describing Nottinghamshire County Council as the nigger in the woodpile. Councillor Michael Rich, who's the leader of Broxtow Borough Council, made the remark at a meeting of the Cabinet and its officers. He has since resigned for any offence he caused, but the Tory opposition leader, Richard Jackson, has insisted that he should resign. Well, uh, Councillor Jackson uh, is with me now, and so is the Lib Dem councillor, David Watson. Well, first of all, I want to point out that the uh, uh, Lib Dem leader has uh, not uh, t agreed to take part in uh, our, our discussion this lunchtime, but has apologised for making that remark. But let's come to... Um, Richard Jackson, first of all, I mean, what um, do you think aggravated you so much? What is so adamant about uh, calling for his head? Well, I mean, clearly it's an absolutely un, uh, unacceptable remark that he made. It was made in a public meeting. It was a meeting of the council's cabinet. Michael Richards got a position. He's the leader of the council. It's a very important role. He's looked at by the employees, but by 100,000 or so residents of the Borough of Broxto, and, and to me, it is clearly not acceptable. It's unacceptable these days. It's unacceptable, but it was compounded by about a week of, uh, of, of, of sort of shilly shallying around the issue afterwards. He attempted, first of all, in the local and in the national press to justify his remarks. Now they're unjustifiable. Well, let's bring David Watson here, because um, it does sound as though your, your leader is unapologetic. He told the, the Daily Telegraph that uh, expression, the expression is well established in the English language. It is well established, but it's not an expression that should have been used. He accepts that. He has apologised unreservedly, both for using the remark and for the offence that it's caused. Uh, at the next council meeting, at the, the council last week, he stood up and offered that apology. OK. Uh, let, let, let's um, come back to you, Richard Jackson, because you were there at the time that he made these remarks. I mean, did, did you... Did you protest at the time? Uh, and, and what did you say? I think at the time, to be fair, there were gasps of... Uh, of, of we were staggered around the room. Staggered? Yeah. We didn't, I didn't say anything, and with hindsight, I wish I had done. Why, why didn't you say something at the time if you, if, if you and... I think and I, was, I, was so just, I was so stunned that he'd made the remark uh, that in that meeting, in the heat of the moment, I didn't say anything. Now, with hindsight, I should have done. Uh, and we made that very clear at the, uh, at the next opportunity at the council meeting last week. But I think what's really driving me at the moment is, is the fact that we're now getting complaints from members of the public. We're now getting complaints from employees. You know, we've got a thousand or so staff. Uh, if we're not careful, this is going to get in the way of the council doing its business, and it can't be allowed to do so. And whilst I might feel sorry for Michael on a personal level, uh, I've got on with him in the past. I think it's time that he realised that this is far bigger than him, and that it really, for the good of the council, it's time that he stepped down. Well, this is an issue uh, that, that, that has hit a, a raw nerve with many of our viewers um, who, who think it, 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 it's wrong to call for, for Council Rich's resignation. Roger Parsons uh, from Hinckley in Leicestershire, for example, he says it's a very old traditional saying, um, shades of Mark Twain, Peter Joy, um, told us that it's time people forgot about political correctness and got on with the real issues. And Malcolm uh, Rattray says that this is PC gone mad. No, I think this is... It goes a lot further than political correctness. You know, political correctness is one thing, and maybe I wouldn't defend everything that comes under the umbrella of political correctness. This is, a, this is an offensive remark. It's caused offence to people in the community in Broxton, and I'm sure uh, in the community more widely, it's not acceptable. I think uh, Richard's right on that. The phrase is wrong, shouldn't have been used, uh, and times have changed. Once it might have been acceptable, it's not now. But if the damage here is what's being done to the public perception, then frankly it's Richard's party who took this to the media. The council meeting, the, the cabinet meeting where it was said, had nobody from the public, nobody from the press. Richard was so shocked that his party went to the media with it. But not haven't one... elected politicians got to be so careful? I mean, the, the Sunday Telegraph today uh, runs a story about... Uh, 
a, a Tory candidate in South Wales who's been dropped by David Cameron as a candidate because he took part in a, in a debate where he referred to, it, uh, to, refer to Italians as greasy wops. Yeah, and that uh, was done over the media, that was done on a radio show, and he has, I think, quite rightly there, resigned because of, of the format. He was forced of, to go, wasn't he? By, um, the, by David Cameron. So it, depend, always... it depends on who you read as to, to whether he was forced or whether he resigned, but certainly he's gone. But there, that was a, a comment broadcast across the media. It's very different to a comment made in a meeting where nobody from the public is present. Richard is so shocked that his office is next door to Michael's in the council. Not once has he knocked on the door and said, actually, Michael, you're inappropriate in your use of the phrase there. You shouldn't have done it. Richard. Yeah. Michael's very aware of, of, of my feelings about what he said and why he shouldn't have said yes, it. he's read them in the paper. It's absolutely. But, I mean, the problem is, regardless of whether there was any member of the public in the meeting, Michael is the leader of the council. He's democratically elected. He's got a position. He shouldn't have said it. I think even David accepts that. Now, the difference between what you've talked about and the, the, the Welsh candidate is that that's a, a party that's recognised that that was wrong, has taken decisive action and has removed him. I really genuinely thought that David and his colleagues, when they had a chance to talk to Michael behind closed doors as the group, as the Liberal Democrat group on the council, would have actually exercised that and would okay, have done David, something briefly, about I mean, Michael this and moved issue him isn't going to end here, is it? Um, that's up to, uh, up to the public. You know, Richard actually said on Wednesday that if Michael apologised, then that would be the end of the matter. Clearly that wasn't true because we're here now. Michael has apologised. I'm happy to accept that. I'm a Christian. Okay. I'm in the forgiveness business. OK. David Watts and clear. Richard Jackson, thank you very much indeed. That's all we've got time for. Yeah. Thank you very much for joining thank us this lunchtime. Now, for pupils with hearing problems, school clearly poses additional challenges. MPs say that, that that's no excuse for the huge gap between what they and other pupils achieve at GCSE. Rob Whitehouse reports from the School for Deaf Children in Derby. Any problems, questions, please put your hand up. Try your best. Good luck. It's an all, all too familiar theme at this time of the year as thousands of students suffer the stress of the exam season. But deaf teenagers like these in Derby may have even more to worry about than most, according to a hard-hitting campaign by the National Deaf Children's Society. The society says deaf children are failing the grade when it comes to GCSEs. Only 33% achieve 5, grade A to C.